On Sunday, April 30th of 1989, the police were called to the scene of something awful that took place at the Pelly family residence. They're quoted saying, no human being should have ever seen what we saw that morning. This is the prom night murders. Hello friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime, and also playing the guitar. But today, we're going to go over the case of Jeff Pelly and what happened to his family. This is a longer video than I normally do, because of the fact that there are so many twists and turns that you're gonna be beyond yourself at the end, so. Stay tuned. Also, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Counterclock Podcast, as for without them, this video would not be possible. For our story today, we're heading to Lakeville, Indiana, a very small town with a population of under 900 people. Overall, there's not much to do here. You could visit Potato Creek State Park and see some beautiful scenery and even go fishing. Or you could go to the Thistleberry Farm and have a grand old time riding go-karts. Lakeville isn't really known for much, but there is one thing it's known for, and that's murder. And that actually brings us to our story today. Robert Jeffrey Pelly was born on December 10th of 1971 in Florence, Kentucky to his parents Robert and Ava Pelly. He was named after his dad. A few years later, a second child was born and this time they had a daughter named Jackie. In 1980, when Jeff was nine years old, the family packed their bags and moved to Cape Coral, Florida. Bob, Jeff's father, had landed a new job in computer programming at a company called Landmark Bank and so it was necessary for them to go. Jeff and Jackie were were brought up on Christianity and always went to church, and their father played a large role in this. Bob was pretty hard on them and big on not allowing them to cry because that's the way that he grew up, but they definitely were allowed to show emotion in front of their mother, Ava. And in February of 1985, Ava would sadly end up passing away from skin cancer after she had basically went into a coma because she refused to have any treatment done. Within a few months, Jeff's father would meet a 27-year-old woman named Dawn Huber. Dawn, just like Bob, had also recently lost her significant other. The way they met was that Bob had a cousin named Katie, and she just so happened to be best friends with Dawn. It was literally only nine months after Ava had passed away before they got married in a small church ceremony in Ohio. Jeff and Jackie weren't even invited to this wedding, but Dawn's daughters were. She had three daughters at the time. It was five-year-old Jessica, four-year-old Janelle, and two-year-old Jolene. A few months later, in 1986, the family decided to move to Lakeville, Indiana after Bob announced that he had been called to the ministry. He felt like he was destined to become a pastor and the church decided to offer him a position. The Olive Branch United Brethren Church was calling his name and his salary was to be set at about $1,300 a month. The church was also relatively small with only about 40 to 50 members. The family would be allowed to stay across the street at a parsonage for free. A parsonage is a church house that's provided for a member of the clergy. Jeff started to attend Lawville Junior Senior High School and got a job at McDonald's and was well liked amongst his peers. He also would start a relationship with a girl named Darla Emmons. A few years later, however, something absolutely horrific would happen. On Sunday, April 30th of 1989, a member of the church named Dave Hathaway was responsible for making sure that everyone got there on time at 9.30 in the morning. He noticed that at around 9.15 to 9.20, Bob and his family were nowhere to be found and this was very unusual. Bob was the pastor and pretty much ran the church and was always there before nine. At around 9.15, an 11-year-old girl named Stephanie Fagan who was friends with the Pelly's daughters, went over from the church to the family's parsonage. This was something that Stephanie routinely did on Sundays. But when she got to the back door of the family's garage, she noticed it was locked and so she thought that was weird. She then tried to open a sliding glass door located in the back and that was also locked. So Stephanie ran back to the church and figured that she somehow missed them. Stephanie told her father, a man named Henry, and him and Dave started talking about it, and so they figured that the Pelly family just slept in. At 9.30, Dave asked a young member of the church if he could lead the service so he could try to figure out where Pastor Bob was. He walked over to the Pelly's parsonage and knocked on the front door and back doors, but there was no answer. All the blinds were pulled down and the curtains were shut so he couldn't see anything. Dave then returned to the church and he sat in the back row 
but something felt very off to him. A few minutes passed, and then him and another man who worked for the church named Wilmot Tisdale decided to use a spare key to try to get into the parsonage. The spare key was used for the church, but they figured that it might work there too. The key ended up not working, and so a woman named Lydia Easterday saw them struggling, and so she walked over and offered them another key. This one came from her husband, who was a staff member of the church. Dave first tried the key on the back door, and it didn't work, and so he walked around to the front, and he tried that door, and it ended up working. At 10.05 in the morning, Dave walked inside the Pelly's parsonage, and what he saw would never leave his memories. He took a few steps into the front hallway and saw Bob's eyeglasses laying on the carpet. Dave immediately knew that something was very wrong. He walked over to the glasses, and as he was standing on top of them, he looked to his left, and he saw Bob laying face down in a pool of blood. Dave then went to the back door and let Wilmot and Lydia inside, and told them that they need to call 911 right now. He continued walking around, and he saw the stairs that led down to the basement, and so he looked down them. He saw two small feet wearing white socks, and that was all he could see because it was dimly lit. Dave's heart immediately sank because he knew that it was one of the kids. Soon the paramedics would get there, and Dave told them not to touch anything because he felt that there had been a murder. They turned a light on, and this is important down the line, so remember this. And then they went to check on Bob, and then went downstairs and found Dawn, Janelle, and Jolene all deceased in the basement. Bob was 39 years old, Dawn was 33 years old, Janelle was eight years old, and Jolene was only six years old. All four of them had been shot with a 20 gauge shotgun, but there were three children still unaccounted for. Jessica, Jackie, and Jeff. Jessica was nine years old at the time, and she was spending the night at a friend's house, and her friend's mom drove her home that morning. They pulled up to the parsonage and saw yellow caution tape everywhere, and Jessica thought something happened to her dog. A police officer came over to their window, and her friend's mom stepped out of the car, and she got told the news and then she told Jessica. Jackie was 14 years old at the time. I was about an hour and a half away at Huntington College visiting friends from a church camp. That's a little weird. But a bishop from their church came and picked her up and didn't really tell her the news, so she was very surprised when she got home. Jeff was 17 years old at the time, and the detectives found out that he was at Six Flags Great America. They found this out through Jessica, but let's dive a little bit deeper into Jeff really quickly. When Bob and Dawn got married, Bob wanted the children to call her mom. Jeff and Jackie obviously refused. And to be fair, that's a bit disrespectful as it's not their mom. Their mom just passed away not even a year prior. They couldn't just forget about her. They also didn't agree with the way that Dawn was raising her girls because it was different from the way that they were raised. According to Jeff's neighbor, Sheila Saunders, he was the outcast of the family. About six weeks before this happened, he was arrested for stealing CDs and cash from one of his neighbors named John Hertzeg. John didn't press charges and ended up working out a deal with Jeff. His father was very angry over this and told him that he wasn't allowed to go to prom. Bob told a lot of people at the church about Jeff's bad behavior, and he even told Wilmot that he took some things out of Jeff's car so he couldn't drive it. Jeff had a 1984 two-door silver Ford Mustang at the time, and it was loud and noticeable. But it was now time for the police to track him down, which wasn't very hard. Jeff, Darla, and a bunch of other friends went to Six Flags Great America theme park in Gurney, Illinois, about two and a half hours away. While him and Darla were standing in line waiting for a ride, he became sad because he felt like something wasn't right. He said that he couldn't put his finger on it though. Jeff then said he really thinks something bad happened, and Darla said, like what? And he replied, well, I don't know, but don't worry about it. It's okay. The police would soon get there and separate the friends from Darla and Jeff and then interview them all to figure out what they know about him and what he did last night. Jeff was also interviewed, so here's some of that. I guess what we want to talk to you about is um, when was the last time you were home? At about quarter to five. Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. Everybody was still home when you left, right? Was everybody there? Dad and Don and Janelle and Jolene were there. Jessica was at a friend's house and Jackie was in Huntington. When you were a great American, that uh, detective or police officer up there 
had you in the room and, and told your parents had been murdered. What, what was your reaction to that? I was shocked. I started crying. I mean, it, it stunned me. I didn't know how it could happen. I don't know why it would happen. Was there anybody in the family you really didn't get along with? How about your stepmother? We didn't get along real well. I mean, we talked hi, bye type thing, but we never really talked to each other or anything. I mean, I didn't, I didn't hate her or anything, but we just, we, we tolerated each other. And how about your stepsisters? Which ones? Uh, all three of them? What about them? Did you get along with them? Oh, I got along with the girls great. I just love the girls. Did you and your dad get in any arguments uh, Saturday? No, we had a real good day Saturday. We got along real well. What do you mean you, you and your dad had a real good day? Saturday we didn't argue at all. Um, it was, he was really, he, he said that I'd been doing a pretty good job of shaping up and everything. So do you know who killed your mother and father? Or you, your father and No, I, I really don't. I, I don't know who would want to. Did you have anything to do with it? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I... Me and my father didn't get along sometimes, and sometimes I'd be really upset with him. But we always worked things out. I, I could sit back later and see where he was coming from. It did get kind of rough for you as far as the, um, him telling you he didn't want you to go to prom or at the after prom party or whatever? Did it did. I was, I was upset, and I kept trying to talk him into it. and. At first he kept saying no, and then he finally agreed to let me go. During this period of time, the police had really started to try and pinpoint everything on Jeff. But you're going to hear a lot of discrepancies and things that make you wonder, was it really him? Like I said before, Jeff originally wasn't allowed to go to prom, but Bob decided to let him go anyway, according to Jeff and Jackie. Bob was typically very harsh on punishments at first, but when he later cooled down, he made them less severe. At the crime scene, the detectives found some very interesting things. They found a few wet washcloths in the tub. They took a lot of things that you would think that they would too, such as carpet, and some walls and some bullet fragments from the furniture, but they also found a set of keys in a trash barrel outside of the house that had a heart-shaped locket which contained a photo of a man and a woman. The investigators paid pretty much zero attention to this, even down to the point where they didn't photograph them for evidence. On Jeff's bed was pictures of his life during the first seven years in a photo book. They also took a load of laundry that had been washed the same day containing only Jeff's clothing. There was no 20 gauge shotgun found inside of the house and there were no shell casings found either. This means that whoever did this picked up all of the shells and got rid of the gun and ammo. Now the Pelly family did own a 20 gauge shotgun. It was a Mossberg Model 500 and Bob bought it in December of 1987 from a guy named Steve Diller. He traded in a 44 caliber handgun for it and Steve gave him back $90 because it was just worth more. Bob told Steve that the shotgun was going to be a Christmas present for Jeff that year. The gun was apparently normally hanging up on a rack downstairs, but it was now gone and remember this for later. Let's revisit Saturday, April 29th of 1989, the day before. The day started off pretty normal, and Jeff had work at McDonald's during a morning shift. The guy that Bob bought the shotgun from, Steve, ended up owning a gun store, and so Bob stopped by that morning. He was looking to buy a handgun for Dawn, but he didn't buy anything, so he just left the store. He then drove to McDonald's at about 11.30, and then picked up Jeff. Together, the two drove back to the parsonage. Bob had become an amateur photographer and was going to take photos of some of the couples that attended the church. There are a lot of eyewitness accounts that say multiple different things. It's important to note here that the time frame of when the family could have been murdered is very slim and about 15 minutes long. Eyewitness accounts made it clear that it had to have been between 510 to 5.25 p.m. One couple, Kim Oldenburg and her date, David, stopped by to have their pictures taken by Bob. They then left and last saw the Pellies alive between 4.40 and 5. Another guy named Matt Miller was there, but he had to abruptly leave to go get his corsage at his house because he forgot it. At around 5.15 to 5.20, he drove by the Parsonage and saw that Jeff's Mustang was still parked outside. At 5.30, Kim, David, Matt, and his date drove by the Parsonage again 
but this time Jeff's car was gone. Bob and the girls were all supposed to stop by another churchgoer's house named Crystal Easter Day to take her photos also, but they never made it there. Crystal waited for about 15 minutes until 5.45 and then decided to drive over to the Parsonage instead. When her and her date got there, they knocked on the garage door and the sliding glass door in the back, but there was no answer. They noticed that all the cars were in the driveway, except for Jeff's Mustang. Another person named Kurt Schaefer, who was considered to be good friends with Jeff and his cousin Ken, said that they saw Jeff leaving the Parsonage at around 4.45 to 5. Kurt said that he knew it was Jeff's car because of its speed and sound. There was also a woman named Lois Stansbury, and she told one of the lead detectives on the case that she saw Bob Pelly standing in his driveway at around 5 p.m. She said she was running errands and was driving by, when she stopped to say hello and wave to Bob. He was talking to a man in a black pickup truck and Lois said he was holding a shovel or something of that sort. Lois then honked to get his attention and she waved and Bob waved back, but he appeared to be busy. Who this man was in the black truck, he was never identified. A gas station clerk named Dennis Nicodemus, who was working at an Amico that was about six minutes away from the Parsonage, said he saw Jeff pull into the gas station and start working underneath the hood of his Mustang. He was wearing a black Hawaiian t-shirt and a pair of blue jeans. Dennis first checked his watch and it read 517, and he noticed this for a fact because he was supposed to get off at five, but the person who was relieving him was running late. At 5.20, Jeff came into the store and he told Dennis that his car was idling too high and so he asked to use the phone to call Darla because he was running late. Jeff was supposed to meet at Lynette Greer's house, who was another friend of theirs, at 5.30. Dennis said Jeff placed the call and then went back outside to work on his Mustang. The coworker finally showed up and at 5.37, Jeff left the gas station and Dennis clocked out for the day. Jeff then got to Lynette Greer's at around 5.45, and this is backed by his girlfriend. Afterwards, the two of them and Lynette and her date, Mark, went to meet another group of friends at the Emporium restaurant. They got there around 6.15ish and everyone said that Jeff was acting very normal. They all said that he was just enjoying the night and life in general. Jeff, Darla, and their friends then went to prom and I think they went bowling. And then I, I'm not too sure where Jeff spent the night afterwards, but they went to Six Flags in the morning and then the police came. After his interrogation and the police talked to people who were with him pretty much all night, he came back squeaky clean. At this point, there was nothing that tied Jeff to the crimes, and so the case started to go cold, and the children that were left over started to grow up. Jeff and his girlfriend went off to college, and his sisters went to live with their grandparents and in foster care. Unfortunately, his relationship did not work, and so he moved back to Lakeville. His reputation was tarnished though, and so he decided to move to Fort Myers, Florida. Jeff started working a job in the credit bureau business that was owned by a longtime family friend named Philip Hawley. The Hawley family took him in as one of their own, and Jeff eventually got married to one of Philip's nieces, Kim. He was doing great, but then he tried to pull a bit of a fast one. Jeff and his sisters were left inheritance money. Both of them were left about $65,000 each, and he was left about $48,000. They were not allowed access to this money until they were 23 years old. Jeff really started to try and get it, and even ended up making a fake story about him having skin cancer and needing surgery to remove it. He took it the next step and forged documents to prove that he actually did, but the doctor's names weren't on the hospital staff list. This would make Jeff be federally investigated and tracked for a few years to try to expose him for medical fraud. The FBI agents on the Pelly's family case back in Indiana were also involved with this to try and get him to admit to that as well. They set him up and eventually Jeff got charged with wire fraud fraud and was sentenced to probation. This was the lesser charge. I don't think it's right to do that, but like at the same time, it's his money. So I kind of understand it. After this, Jeff started working with computers and got a job traveling internationally as a consultant for the International Business Machines Corporation or IBM. Him and his wife, Kim had a son they moved to Dade City and bought a home for about a half a million dollars. They filed for a divorce in 1997 but eventually made up and got back together. John Botich and Mark Center, the two detectives on the case, were very adamant that Jeff was responsible for this. They were not going to go down without convicting him some way or another, and in 2000, the county prosecutor in Lakeville changed. The new guy's name was Chris Toth, 
and he agreed to pursue charges in the Pelly case. When he won the election, he created a new team that was dedicated to solving cold cases. Chris put a man named Craig Whitfield in charge of this particular case. Craig decided to track down Jackie and Jessica, Jeff's sisters who survived, and interview them both. Jessica, well, she now goes by Jesse, wasn't really a part of the family anymore, and she didn't talk to either of the other remaining siblings. As a child, she was in and out of foster care and struggled with substance abuse in her late teens to early adulthood. She also became a mother of two kids and was out of the loop on a lot of things. When Craig interviewed her, she thought that Bob was responsible for everything. She didn't find out until she was in her 20s that Jeff was being looked at as the prime suspect. Jesse then recalled an interaction that she had with Jeff about six years after the murders happened when she was 15 years old. This was the last time she saw him or spoke to him. Jeff called her to tell her to come visit him and his new wife in Florida, and so she went down for about two weeks. Apparently while she was there, Jeff asked her, well, who do you think did it? And she said, your dad. And he replied, oh, okay. Jesse thought that Jeff asked this question because he was suspicious that she might think that he did it. Craig then went and interviewed Jackie, but she came with a lawyer because she was tired of things getting twisted around. The detective started to really believe that the only possible suspect was Jeff. They tried to build a case on him doing anything that they could, but they needed hard evidence to prove that he was guilty. So the detectives believed that the laundry that was found was a key to solving this case. According to Craig Whitfield, the lead investigator, investigator on the case, he said it was a dark and pink striped shirt, a pair of blue jeans, and two white socks packed inside of an Annis Finer Foods bag. Inside of one of the pockets in the jeans, the FBI found 34 coins and a dollar which totaled up to $4.50 and a receipt for Anna's grocery. Craig believed that the jeans being in the washer was incriminating and probable cause to arrest Jeff. He thought that the money and receipt were left in the pocket because Jeff was preoccupied and in a rush to take them off, forgot them. But apparently a pair of blue jeans was never found in the washer only a shirt and some socks. And not a single detective or officer involved personally said they handled a pair of blue jeans. Jeff was wearing a pair of blue jeans when he went to Lynette's house before prom. Another thing here is that no officer ever went to Anna's grocery to confirm if he had been there or not. Nobody ever came forward and said that they personally saw him there. The last thing here is, why are the police using a grocery bag to store evidence? Craig said that this is to let the jeans breathe, and if there's any biological evidence on them, they need to be put on paper. So once again, why a grocery bag? It doesn't make any sense. And is it possible that the receipt and change were actually just inside of the bag? And where did the bag come from? Lynette Greer's mother, Rebecca, actually worked at Anna's Grocery during this period of time. Perhaps if Jeff went over there to get ready, she gave him a bag to use. It's likely that the jeans were never washed and were not found in the washing machine with the shirt and the socks. They seized Jeff's clothes that were in the back of the Mustang, and this contained the Hawaiian shirt, so maybe they mixed the evidence together. Craig then wrote up a probable cause statement for his arrest, and the newly elected prosecutor approved the warrant on August 10th of 2002. 13 years after Jeff's family was viciously taken from this world, he was arrested on four counts of first degree murder. Craig, with a SWAT team behind him, went and surrounded Jeff's house, but he wasn't home. He was 30 years old at the time, and was in Los Angeles after he had just gotten back from a work trip in Australia. While he was at the airport, customs checked him in and detained him because he had a warrant for his arrest. Jeff was now going to fight a battle in court and his apparent motive was not being allowed to go to prom. His sister Jackie and his wife Kim found a defense attorney named Alan Baum. Alan had never heard of the case before, but he decided to try and help Jeff all the way through. The first step was to try and get him bond, but that didn't work because he was considered to be a flight risk. From 2003 to 2006, there were multiple delays in this trial. Allen kept trying to get the case thrown out on the fact that Jeff's right to a speedy trial had been violated. Jeff ended up getting out on bond for basically all of 2005, and in 2006, it was officially time for trial. The lead prosecutor's name was Frank Schaefer. He argued that Jeff was responsible for this, even though there was basically no evidence proving this. Allen argued that there wasn't a proper police investigation and they had tunnel vision on Jeff 
and did basically everything wrong. Jackie and Jesse, Jeff's two remaining siblings, both took the stand and had different things to say. Jesse said that she saw the 20 gauge shotgun hanging in her parents' bedroom before she left for her sleepover. But Jackie said that the 20 gauge shotgun was removed the year prior along with any other firearms in the house. Jeff also said this during his police interrogation because he was thinking of the end game and actually tried to act on it. So Bob decided to get rid of any firearms in the house because he didn't feel that Jeff was safe around them. He gave them to a man named Thomas Kebb. It was a bag containing a shotgun, a rifle, and a pistol. Thomas stored them at his in-law's house in their basement. The weird part here is that the investigators never interviewed Thomas or asked to retrieve the guns. Alan decided not to use Thomas as a witness because he was worried that Jeff's mental state during that period of time would have definitely altered the jury's decision. The prosecution didn't want to call Thomas because if they did, their case against Jeff would fail. Jesse also said on stand that her mom told her that Jeff was going to be allowed to go to Six Flags Great America. So Alan thought for sure that this was reasonable doubt because it proved that Jeff was allowed to go to prom. Dave Hathaway, the man who found Bob and his family, said in 1989, the blood he saw on the carpet and surrounding the family was wet. If the blood was wet, that would have meant that it recently happened. And if you remember, Dave found them at around 10 a.m. When Dave took the stand in 2006, for some reason, he said that the blood was dry. Sheila Saunders, the Pelly's next door neighbor, claimed that she saw a light on in their basement on Saturday night at 9.15 p.m. and again at 2 a.m. Dave said that the paramedics turned a light on while they were going through the basement. So this would mean that the light somehow had to have been turned off before 10 a.m. The washcloths were also wet, and Alan brought in a professional who did several experiments proving that they would be dry within about 12 hours. Jeff had been gone for about 19 hours at the point in time of which they found them. But because these experiments were conducted in Arizona and not Indiana, their argument was considered a dud. The jeans that Jeff was wearing also had zero traces of blood on them. Alan argued about the time and that Jeff wouldn't have the ability to do everything in 15 minutes. It's impossible. An interesting thing that came up during the trial was what was found in Bob's stomach. He had popcorn kernels in his lower intestines, and this proved something. Jackie said that her father always ate popcorn every night. At this point, it was like a routine for him. Between 7 to 8 p.m., he would eat some, usually after putting the girls to bed and having dinner. Police reports showed that a bowl of pop popcorn was found on Bob's desk in the basement. This practically screams that he had the opportunity to make and eat popcorn before that all occurred. Alan also said that he believes there was more than one shooter. The reason for this is because there were two different types of shotgun shell waddings found at the scene. Some were plastic and some were paper. This suggests that whoever's responsible for this either A, used two different types of ammunition, or B, there were two suspects who had two different shotguns. A key factor here is that the Pelly family's Mossberg 500 only had a cartridge that allowed for five rounds. There were six total shots taken. Jeff never testified at his own trial, and this was because his prosecutors decided that it just wasn't worth the risk. On July 22nd of 2006, he was convicted on all counts against him, and on October 17th, he was sentenced to 160 years in prison. This absolutely shocked some people, and some people, including Jesse, Jeff's stepsister, were relieved about this. This is where things are about to take a very interesting turn. Not that everything before this isn't shocking enough. The revelations you're about to hear are, well, insane. First off, Jeff has a new lawyer that has been trying to help him get out named Frances Watson. She's gathered a ton of evidence that supports that Jeff was wrongfully convicted and that Alan, his previous attorney, wasn't competent enough at the trial. A big part of this was the blue jeans and the receipt from the grocery store. Frances believes that there's no way they were washed and that the prosecution lied about taking them out of the washing machine and they were presented as false evidence. She also believes that the fact that Jeff had no blood on him anywhere proves that he was innocent and his right to a speedy trial was violated. The last thing that Francis brought up is something that was recently discovered that could show that Jeff has been wrongfully convicted this entire time. She believes that while Bob was working at his landmark bank job in Fort Myers, Florida, he had a close relationship to a man named Phil Hawley and this is the reason that he was killed alongside his family. The same Phil Hawley that took in Jeff when he went to Florida. Bob was the lead supervisor of Phil's business 
and he oversaw thousands of transactions, transfers, and investments. He was shown a lot of confidential information that involved millions of dollars. He attended a church in Fort Myers called the First Church of Nazarene, and this is where a pastor named Michael Ross comes into play. Michael said that Bob came to him asking for advice. Bob said that he discovered improper handling of funds and he didn't know what to do about it. He was scared for his life and his family's lives, and he just wanted to move to Indiana to get away. The people that were committing the fraud were apparently some of his closest friends. When Bob took the job at Olive Branch United Brethren Church, he wasn't an ordained minister, and he wasn't even in the process of becoming one. This isn't standard practice, and Michael was pretty confused about this. Jackie Pelly said that her father started to become a bit paranoid around this time, always feeling like someone was there, watching him. There was also another person who came forward named Tony Beeler. In February of 1989, she was a saleswoman for a company called United Church Directories. Her and a photographer would visit churches and take pictures as part of their package deal. One day, they visited the Olive Branch United Brethren to take photos of the Pelly family. Bob called Tony over and asked her to not have the church directories made because of his life before the ministry. He was not a minister. He was acting like one. He told her that there were people that were looking for him, and if they found him, they would kill him and his family, and this was their goal. Tony was really confused about this and was like, I don't want to hear this. Why is he telling me this? If he wants out of the directory, I won't print the directory. She then called her manager and told her that she didn't want to do it, but she had to anyway. Tony actually went to the detectives in May of 2003 after she heard about what happened. An investigator named Timothy Decker interviewed her for about 23 minutes, and this was recorded. Apparently, they lost the recordings, and so it never made its way to the trial or to the defense attorneys. Oh! Of course they did. The last thing here is that another man who was connected to Landmark Bank in Fort Myers was also murdered in a very similar way. His name was Eric Dawson. Eric was successful in business, but also not at the same time. And because of bad investments, he was fined $30,000 for selling securities, but misrepresenting them. In the summer of 1987, Eric Dawson met Philip Hawley. The same Philip Hawley who Bob worked for and took in Jeff. Phil's business was the Fort Myers Credit Bureau, and he was really trying to make Eric pay his debt. Like, he was really hounding him to get it done. Eric stopped by the business one day, and him and Phil immediately became friends. By the next summer, they invested over $2 million together to develop some large properties. But only a few months later, on September 9th of 1988, Eric Dawson disappeared. About two months later, on November 21st, his body was found in some damp brush off of Corkscrew Road in Lee County, Florida. He was shot execution style in the back of the head and then thrown in a hole and covered with concrete. Before Eric's body was found, Philip Hawley and his family were constantly visiting Eric's wife and children. But as soon as his body came up, the Hawleys immediately halted all communication. After Eric disappeared, Phil had appointed himself president of the Back Babe Condo Club, and this gave him financial control of everything. Also, eight days before he disappeared, Phil filed a quiet claim deed to transfer Eric's ownership of a 72-acre tract of land. It was to go to one of Phil's companies. In order for this to go through, it would require signatures from Eric and Phil. According to Eric's colleagues and his closest friends, he never mentioned anything about this. So the attorney representing Eric's estate was convinced that his signature on the deed was fake. On April 1st of 1989, the police raided Phil's home. They found out that the deed was just a photocopy and wasn't the original, and they also found hundreds of stock certificates for businesses. One of Phil's sons also owned a construction business that always had concrete readily available. About 10 months later, Phil Hawley and his three sons, David, Danny, and Paul, were charged with several counts of forgery, grand theft, and lying to the police. They couldn't be charged with murder because there was no proof, but the allegations that were against them were pretty severe. A FBI forensic handwriting expert testified that Eric Dawson's signature was 100% photocopied and printed onto the deed. They took a signature that he put onto an actual document in 1988 
and just copied it. It was an exact match, and that would be impossible because handwriting does not work that way. The Hawleys also forged other documents to say that they were investing more than they were, but these proved to be fake as well. At the end of the trial, Phil was found guilty of 15 felony counts of grand theft and forgery. His sons were also given a bunch of felonies and forgery counts. The judge ended up giving them incredibly light sentences. Phil was given 120 days in jail, mostly to serve on the weekends, and require probation for 20 years, but they only made him report to a probation officer for 12. His children were given zero jail time and no probation. Ah, makes sense. A lot of people thought that the judge was partial to the Hawley family, and I mean, it kind of looks that way. The last thing that I'm going to touch down on is the fact that Philip Hawley received three life insurance policies from a man named Harry William Stewart. Harry was supposedly a tenant to Philip, and he supposedly drove his car off a cliff and was never seen again. But it was found out that Harry never actually existed, even though there was a passport and a birth certificate. It was all fake, but the passport was real and whoever it was signed a two-page legal document. If you look at the picture, it looks as though it's Bob Pelly, and here's the kicker. We know that Bob was working for Phil during this period of time, and Phil was supposedly the main beneficiary of Harry's life insurance policy. Now let's think about everything for a bit and ask a few questions. Why on earth would you make your landlord the beneficiary of your things? It doesn't make any sense. How could Jeff possibly commit such a crime in such a short period of time? Under 15 minutes to do that, pick up the shotgun shells, take a shower, throw clothes in the washing machine. No, there's not enough time. If all of the weapons were taken away from the house, why did the police never recover them? Who were the people on the locket and why is there no picture of them? And where is the locket at? Also, do these jeans really look washed to you? Not to me, and that money doesn't either. Plus, how did a receipt and coins stay inside of a pocket in the washing machine? Wouldn't it destroy them? We could sit here all day and ask a million questions, but there's really some evidence here that suggests that Jeff might just be innocent. Bob, Dawn, Janelle, and Jolene Pelly were having a normal Saturday night and had absolutely no idea what was coming to them. It's incredibly sad, especially when children are involved and I don't know how someone could possibly live with themselves knowing that they did such a thing. I hope that if Jeff Pelly actually did do this, he remains in jail for the rest of his life. But if he's innocent, somebody f***ed up. His attorney is trying her hardest to get Jeff freed and has been bringing forth all this new evidence from Counterclock Podcast, so hopefully something gives. To me, and I'm just a spectator, I think he might be innocent. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrifying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. Once again, I just want to give a big shout out to the Counterclock Podcast for all of this information as this video would not be possible without them. So go check out their podcast all about the Pelly case. But I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.